Catherine, are you um, taping this? Yes. Thank you. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Laramie County Master Gardener Gardening for Success, also hosted by the Laramie County Extension Office. And tonight's program is by Kathy Shreve, and her program is going to be on raised bed gardening and how to be successful in raised beds and for maximum production or just to get enough. And I am going to, well, Kathy is a, of course, obviously a master gardener. She's been a master gardener for 2004, 2003, I think. 2003, I think. So she's been, yeah, 2003. So she has been a master gardener for a long time and <clears throat> grows amazing vegetables and, and flowers and plants. If you ever go by her place on Schneider, you understand why you, you can't miss her place because it's obvious that a master gardener lives there and is growing plants. And it's just the front yard. The backyard is where everything, all the magic happens as far as growing plants and getting stuff started. So with that, I am going to turn the program over to Kathy and let her teach us about raised bed gardening in Cheyenne. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm going to talk about raised bed gardening, specifically in Cheyenne. Um, I've kind of directed this talk towards vegetable gardening, but you can do ornamentals in raised beds too, particularly if you're interested in growing something that's not quite happy to be growing in Cheyenne. It's easy to control microclimates and so on in a raised bed. So with that, we'll just get started. So why would you want to garden in raised beds? It does seem like a lot of work to build the beds, fill them with soil, so on and so forth. But let's say that you're in an area that doesn't have very good soil for gardening and you want to really garden. With a raised bed, that's not a problem. You can mix up and put whatever, whatever soil blend you want into the raised bed and then your bad soil kind of goes away. Suppose you want to grow something that needs special conditions, like you want to, you know, do a champion watermelon in Wyoming. Well, it would be a lot easier to do in a raised bed than in a conventional garden bed because you have a lot more control over the microclimate. There are a lot less work to cultivate and weed. While I love gardening, weeding is not my favorite thing to do. So anything that cuts back on the weeding gets my vote. It's great for small spaces and spaces where conventional gardening is just not possible. <clears throat> are you a person that has mobility issues? Raised bed gardening could be just the ticket for you to get back into the gardening game. You have critter problems. Raised beds don't usually appeal to small critters. And for bigger persistent critters, you can add a critter excluding superstructure on top of your raised bed to keep the greedy critters out. There are things that you do need to be aware of for raised beds though. Because they are raised, they tend to drain a lot more quicker than uh, regular garden beds. So they probably need more frequent watering and fertilization because you're gonna plant them intensively, I hope. They're not so good for crops that need a lot of space unless you get really creative about it. Let's say that you have a family of 10 and you want to grow enough corn to get you through the winter. Raised beds probably aren't the way to go. You'd probably be better off with a regular garden for that. You do have to take the time to engineer and site them properly or you'll have issues. And we'll talk more about these things as we go on through the presentation. You can build your raised beds out of lots of different things. Your imagination is kind of the limit there. I've seen nice ones made, of course, out of wood. You can also make them out of tin, brick, fender blocks, large garden pots. That's still a raised bed, even if it is a garden pot. Stone, hay bales. You can also use sound items like old holy stock tanks, giant tires, construction salvage, like I said. Your imagination is pretty much the limit. I worked with one lady who wanted to build raised beds out of hay bales, and I was kind of like, well, those aren't going to last very long. And she's like, well, I'm renting right now this year, and my landlord has said that I could have raised beds as long as there would be nothing left by the time I moved out. And I'm like, well, hay bales ought to work. 
because they'll decompose as the growing season goes on and they work perfectly. I also visited a fellow who was an appliance repairman and what he had done was he'd taken the tubs out of like 20 or so dishwashers and he was using those for his raised beds. And they're kind of kitschy looking, but they kind of suited him. So, you know, it just depends on what you want. <clears throat> so here's a raised bed checklist. You need to check off all these items if you're gonna have maximum success. You need to have some sort of raised bed that has good drainage. Now, if you're just building a wooden or stone frame right on the ground, you're gonna automatically have as good a drainage as whatever soil you're building it on top of. But if you're using something that's got a bottom in it, like say an old stock tank, you may need to make any holes in it bigger because it won't drain as well as something that's sitting right on the ground. So it's just something to think of. <clears throat> Most vegetables are sun-loving plants, so you need to choose an area that has full sun. And in our climate, that's defined as more six or more direct sun hours a day. You need to construct it out of non-toxic materials, so no railroad ties if you're planning to use your raised beds for food production because the creosote in the railroad ties is not good for you. You want to build your raised bed close to an irrigation water source. Why make the watering chore harder than it needs to be? You need to have good access to your raised bed so you can get like your wheelbarrow or garden cart or whatever in there to add soil, compost, mulch, whatever. You want to make sure that your raised bed has a good size and shape so that you can reach every part of the raised bed for planting and harvesting without actually having to actually step into the raised bed. Part of the advantages of a raised bed is you reduce soil compaction. So if you step in there, you've kind of negated that benefit and you don't want to do that. All right, watering. Vegetables are not drought tolerant. You'll need to water on a regular basis if you want the best results. It's better to water deeply and less frequently than an insufficient amount every day. My neighbor across the street put a vegetable garden in his hell strip, which sounds like a great idea, but his idea of sufficient watering is to stand next to the house with his hose and squirt at the vegetable area for about five minutes a day. And then he wonders why his garden isn't producing very well. He didn't ask me, but if he asked me, I would have told him he needed water better. <clears throat> so how do you know that you've watered enough? Your garden soil, once you've watered, should be soft enough that a screwdriver with a long handle pushes in very easily, all the way. How much that is will depend on a number of things. What type of soil do you have? Did you apply mulch? How did you apply water? What's the weather? And what your crop is. A lot of people want me to give them a strict watering schedule, you know, three times a week for an hour every day. Well, that might be fine for July, but come August when it gets hotter, you might need to water more. Or if you can hit a, you know, cool, rainy patch, two week patch of weather, which we can sometimes do in the summer, you might not need to water at all. So strict watering schedules don't work. You just need to pay attention to what's going on. Now, if you're worried about how much all that water will cost you, if you apply mulch and use drip irrigation, you will save big water bucks. So we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. All right, you need to decide, are you gonna be an organic grower or a conventional grower? So if you're an organic grower, you wanna use only natural products, nothing produced synthetically. So you need to look for products with the OMRI label, that stands for Organic Materials Review Institute. Materials with this label are compliant with USDA certified organic requirements. If you're growing conventional, then it's okay to use the artificial stuff. All right, soil and amendments. Now, like I said, since you're going through all of the work to make these wonderful raised beds, take advantage of the opportunity to up your garden soil game. Because most soils here in Cheyenne, if you've done any gardening or, at all, are not that great, particularly when it comes to organic content. So if you make your own compost, you can fill your beds with a 50-50 mix of regular soil, like from your yard, and compost. 
If you can't or don't want to make your own compost, the Cheyenne Compost Facility makes some pretty good compost. If you decide to purchase compost at all, you need to be aware that some composters use dairy litter when they make their compost, which has a high salt content, which ends up being a high salt compost. Always ask for an analysis. The thing to really pay attention to is a parameter called electrical conductivity or specific conductance. If either of those numbers are greater than 2,000 micromoles per centimeter, that compost is too salty and you don't want to buy it. Go somewhere else. <clears throat> so a soil test is always a good idea. The easiest way to figure out what you need to do for a soil test is to contact either UW or uh, CU. They have soil testing labs and they can send you a kit with all the explanation of how to collect the samples and what to do. And then they'll send you the results back with a little explanation of what you need to do. <clears throat> if you're from back east, please be aware that our western soils do not need any lime or wood ashes which people back east are used to adding to their soils on a routine basis. The reason for that is eastern soils tend to be acidic, but western soils tend to be very alkaline. Lime and wood ash are alkaline too, so that's taking an alkalinity problem and making it worse, which you don't want to do. Also, never add uncomposted manure unless you've got some rabbit pellets. Those you can add straight to the garden and do not add any manure from omnivores or carnivores. Only vegetarian creatures get to use, can use those manures like cows, sheep, goats, horses, but you always want to compost it really well before you use it. That will kill the weed seeds and that will break it down so it's not too hot to use on your plants. And by hot, I mean too full of nutrients. It'll burn your plants if you apply it directly. Don't want to do that. <clears throat> All right, let's talk fertilizer. So usually when you're thinking raised bed, you're also thinking intensive planting. And if you're going to do that, you may need some fertilizer to get your best results. I find that it's much better to use a weak fertilizer on a frequent basis than to try to apply all the fertilizer in just one shot during the season. Fertilizer is kind of like getting your hair cut. You know, cut off a little bit, look at it. You can always cut off more, but you can't stick it back on. Fertilizer is kind of the same way. You can always add a little bit more, but once you've added it, you can't take it back out. <clears throat> if you apply more fertilizer than your plants can use immediately, the portion that the plants cannot use just gets washed away. So you're wasting your money. And where does that fertilizer go? It goes usually into the groundwater table, which you don't want. Whatever fertilizer you use, do not ever, ever apply more than the label says. You'll just be wasting your money. And you could burn your plants, which will greatly reduce your, reduce your harvest or pollute groundwater. In the case of fertilizer, more is not better. All right, more is not better. So follow the label. <clears throat> Again, before you fertilize, it's always a good idea to get a soil test. You might not need any fertilizer right away. Or worse, you could add too much of something and hinder your garden's productivity or kill your plants. Did you know that many vegetables produce most abundantly when they're grown just a tad on the lean side? You need to be just a little bit hungry to put on that good fruit in roots or whatever it is you're trying to grow. Too much fertilizer often results in luxuriant foliage growth at the expense of fruit or root production. One of my co-workers decided he was going to build these fancy three foot deep raised beds and I'm like go you know more power to you that sounds great. What I didn't know was that he filled them with an overly rich mixture of compost, manure, He's a big fisherman, so he put fish nets in there too. And then he called me later in the season and said, I've got these huge tomato plants. And I went over and looked, they were truly tomato trees with 
beautiful dark green foliage, but not a blossom or tomato in sight. The reason for that was he put too much fertilizer on and made the tomato plants so happy that they were not in any hurry to get on with the business of reproduction and putting on fruit. So like I said, you need to be just a tad mean to them to get the good fruit. Don't, be, don't make it so cushy for them that they forget what they're supposed to be doing there. All right, choosing plants. Usually when I'm choosing plants, I look for the shortest season vegetable that I can find of that variety. Generally, I'm looking for something with 80 days or less to harvest, days to harvest. And if I can, I like to get seed catalogs. My roommate teases me that I'm the only person that looks forward to junk mail. I politely tell him it is not junk mail. It is a research material. So I look at the descriptions really well and I, if it's, if I'm trying to decide between more than two or three varieties and one says it handles cooler weather well or adverse weather well, I'm probably going to go with that one because our weather here is up and down and all over the map. So I want something that can handle that. If I'm buying transplants, I'm going to choose smaller plants over really big plants. I will choose little two inch pots of tomatoes over the gallon tomatoes. And the reason for that is those small plants transplant better. And of course they're less expensive and I'm kind of known to be a cheesecake, so. <clears throat> now, you got these wonderful raised beds and I'm thinking that you want to get as much production out of them as possible. So there's some tips to get better production. If you want to grow vining crops, like say green beans or cucumbers or something, put trellises on the north side of the beds. And the reason for the north side is so that trellis, once it's covered with whatever plant is growing on it, doesn't shade the rest of your raised bed. So you can grow crops up instead of out. The added benefit to that is the green beans or cucumbers or whatever will be a lot easier to pick, which I'm all for that. You can use staggered block planting techniques instead of rows. In the picture here, the green rectangle on the right shows a staggered uh, a block planting with regular rows. You've got four rows of plants there. I use a staggered technique where you kind of offset the rows a little bit. I managed to fit five rows in, so get a little bit more in. I'm also, in my raised beds, going to try to pick smaller vegetable varieties. I'm going to go for tomato varieties noted as determinate, which are the ones that don't grow so big they eat your house. I'm going to look for bush varieties of cucumber, squash, and melons, unless, of course, I'm growing them on the trellis. And I'm going to look for plants listed as good in containers, because I know that plants that are listed to be good in containers won't elbow their brother and sister plant in the raised bed out of the way and be space hogs. All right, now we're planting. What should we do? So there are some kind of hard and fast rules about how I like to plant stuff. I don't want to waste money on transplant for waste money on transplants for stuff that I can grow from seed because a packet of seed is way cheaper than a six pack of Broccoli plants, for instance. So root crops, legumes, corn, and quick maturing crops such as lettuce and Asian greens are best direct seeded. Slower maturing crops such as tomatoes, peppers, melons, and eggplants are best grown from transplants. If you're talking potatoes, strawberries, or onions, those are best grown from what are known as sets or little seedling plants. All right. And let's say that you planted your radishes or carrots or whatever kind of thick and they come up like a green carpet. You want a little bit of space between each of those baby plants. So you start thinning them. If you don't thin them, it sounds mean. I know you just work so hard to get all these little babies to come up. If you don't thin them, they will never reach their true potential. And all you have is a little bunch of little scraggly one inch long half inch wide carrots, for instance. You do need to thin them. Most of the thinnings you can eat as baby vegetables, so don't feel like they're being wasted. I like to use black plastic or black planter's paper 
for heat loving plants such as tomatoes, peppers, melons, eggplants, and tomatillos because I get much better production out of those plants. Those are plants that originated in very hot to warm climates and they like the extra heat, it really gets them going. I also like to mulch thickly with an organic material. You can use a number of things, leaves, dry grass clippings, pine needles, straw. They'll save you a lot of money on your water bill and again, reduce that onerous weeding that we all hate. Don't plant your seeds too deep. This is one of the biggest problems I see with beginning gardeners. They wanna bury those seeds and get them going. But the rule of thumb is two to three times the seed width is how deep you should plant them. So for most little tiny seeds, that means barely sprinkle the soil on and pat them down. For transplants, except for tomatoes, don't plant too deep. Plant the transplant at the same depth as the plant is growing in the pot. However, for tomatoes, you don't want to plant too shallow. What you want to do is pluck off the bottom two to four sets of leaves and plant that little baby tomato so that only the top leaves are above the ground surface. The reason for that is tomatoes have the amazing ability to grow roots all along their stems. So if you get that root system off to a great start, you're well on your way to having a fantastic tomato plant that produces a ton of tomatoes. <clears throat> Don't plant too close, just because you have six eggplants, broccolis, whatever, but only have room for four, don't cram them in there. Because if you cram them in too tight, you're not gonna get very good production out of those plants. They'll be too competing too much between themselves for water and nutrients. <clears throat> don't, once you plant seeds, don't forget to keep the seed beds moist but not soggy. Remember, plant roots need oxygen too until the plants are well established. Don't neglect the weeding, even though that's everybody's least favorite chore, because every weed in your garden takes food and water away from your crops. All right, now let's talk about pest control. Into every garden, a few bugs must fly, crawl, or creep. However, just because you see a bug in your garden does not mean you should let out a shriek, run get the bug spray, and drown the poor thing. Learn what it is before you kill it. So you see that bug in the background slide of the slide there? What do you think that is? That, my friends, is a larval ladybug. See, he looks kind of horrible, nothing like the uh, ladybugs that you see. If it really is a bad bug, also is just one, if all you see is one, is that really an issue? Could be, if it's an aphid, those things are born pregnant, one aphid is too many. But if you just see one, you know, earwig, that's probably not a problem. Or one snail, probably not a problem. I would leave him alone. Again, this fellow, this creepy looking bug in the background of the slide is an assassin beetle. This bug will eat his weight in aphids if you just leave him alone. So even though he is kind of nasty and creepy and yucky looking, you know, learn what he is and learn that he's your ally before you give him, you know, the old methyl ethyl death spray. If you really do have a garden pest problem, use the least toxic solution possible. Remember, everything that gets on your produce eventually gets into you. And make sure you use the pest solution that is appropriate for the pest that you have. Don't take last year's slug bait and try to kill grasshoppers with it. It's probably not gonna work. You need to direct your pest solution to whatever pest you have. And finally, and I can't stress this enough, read all the instructions for the selected pesticide. If it's a concentrate, mix as directed, and then apply it at the right time, in the right manner, at the right time of day. Some pesticides, for example, neem oil, if you apply it, apply it at temperatures above 80 degrees, it's probably gonna burn your plant. So make sure you know what to do for the selected pesticide. And of course, wear the proper PPE. <clears throat> now here I've included some good raised bed gardening links for you. I'm not gonna read through all those, those are just links check out with even more stuff because I only had 30 minutes. I could only hit the highlights here. And do I have any questions? 
You have to read them to me, Catherine, if I do, because I can't see them. Well, Kathy, you're doing a great job explaining how to do raised beds. And I haven't seen any questions come through other than a question on pH. Mm -hmm. And So we have a question from Steve, and he wants to know what height do you need to build raised beds to keep rabbits out? I would say at least two feet, but be aware that if there's nothing else for those rabbits to eat, they will probably get in that raised bed. You really <laughs> want to keep rabbits out. I would probably think about a chicken wire type exclusion superstructure for that raised bed if you have a bad rabbit problem. So how do you get worms to move into your raised beds? You know, I find that if you provide good soil conditions, they will show up somehow magically on their own. I'm not really sure where they come from. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have earthworms out at my place. And for the life of me, I have no idea how they arrived here. You know, I live 25 mm -hmm. miles out on the prairie and Mm -hmm. It's an area that's never been gardened before, but by golly, mm -hmm. there's earthworms there, so. Yeah, I read something the other day about how earthworms were not in North America until the Europeans showed up, so. I don't know if that's true or not, but interesting. Yep. So, are wood chips a non-toxic mulch for edible plants? They can be, depending on what the wood source for the chips were. Like, if you're chipping up a... Uh, pressure treated lumber, I would not put that on a produce pack. I might put it on my ornamentals. And it's not such a big problem here, but you never want to use um, walnut chips on anything because walnut contains kind of an allopathic chemical that prevents other plants from growing around the walnut tree. And for tall beds, um, do you put in a bottom or completely fill it with soil? Um, I did not when I put my raised bed in, beds in, and they're just kind of rectangular wooden beds, although I wish I had because my neighbors have aspen trees, and those aspen roots have gone like 30 yards from my neighbor's house and are starting to come up in my raised bed. So I wish that I'd put like some hardware mesh or something in the bottom of them. And if I reconstruct them, I certainly will. Wow. <clears throat> so when starting a raised bed on the ground, do you lay down newspaper or cardboard before ordering soil in order to smother the weeds or seeds in the soil underneath? That would be a good idea, or you could treat it with some sort of uh, chemical to kill weeds, or you could solarize away the weed seeds. And by solarize, I mean put clear plastic down for like six weeks before you plant, if you've got that luxury of time. So would you go over one more time watering a raised bed and maybe some of the, the things that you've learned in the past? So what I've learned is water is best applied slowly. So I like to use soaker hoses or emitters on my raised bed rather than walk, walking around with a watering wand and splooshing water on them. That seems to work a lot better and it's less wasteful of water. Like I don't like to use sprinklers on my raised bed. I don't like to use sprinklers at all except on the grass because consistently wet vegetable plants tend to have viral and molds and fungus problems. So I would suggest that you invest in either soaker hoses or some type of drip emitter system. Okay, so putting a drip system together is, is pretty easy. It's pretty mm -hmm. straightforward. And I have found um, drip tape and mm -hmm. drip type material at both Menards and at Home Depot. I've not been in Lowe's yet, but those, both those two places are offering um, drip irrigation. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say that when I was there the other day, the the employee, while well, he was a very nice young man, didn't know anything about irrigation. So yeah, 
So if you want to do soaker hoses, I found that the best source here in town is uh, Sam's. Yep. Yep. Least least expensive. Mm -hmm. How long do and your soaker hoses last for you, Kathy? Um, well, I'm on city water, so it's less uh, alkaline, hard than water out in the country. So I've had my soaker hoses probably um, eight or nine years. They're starting to get really patched up and holy though, so I'll probably be chunking them in the next year or two and starting over. So every year when I start up my raised beds, I put the hoses out, turn the water on, see where the leaks are, patch the leaks. <laughs> I might have to patch a leak or two as the season goes on. <laughs> yep. That's that's pretty good because I live way out in the county and mm -hmm. <clears throat> well my pH is is pretty neutral. I have mm -hmm. a lot of minerals in the yeah. water and those nope. minerals just clog up the soaker hose so yep. fast. Mm -hmm. It almost calcifies the soaker hose into this stiff, unflexible thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so you might better look at emitters. Yep. If you could flush those, you know, at the beginning of the year with like a vinegar solution to unclog them. So do you ever use olas, which are clay pots that are buried in the ground and then you fill them with water to irrigate your raised beds? No, I haven't used those, but I did try one year, particularly I like to grow tomatoes in large containers in my greenhouse. So, you know, if everything gets hailed out, at least I still have tomatoes in the greenhouse. And what I did was I got two liter soda bottles and I poked a lit hole with a nail in the lid, filled it with water, put the lid on and turned it upside down in the large, uh, container of soil where the tomato was and the water kind of slowly seeps out, you know, over a number of days so that I only had to fill those up like every four or five days. So that saved on some watering chores. Okay. So earlier in the program, you mentioned that vegetables weren't drought tolerant. That's Just right. What, what does that mean exactly, not drought tolerant? So they need regular watering on and to be kept fairly well hydrated if you're going to expect to get any good produce out of them. Like don't let your garden soil get so hard and dry and crusty that, you know, you could break hammers with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all experienced that kind of soil. Keep it fairly moist, but not so soggy that the poor plant roots can't get any oxygen. Like I said, if you can take a long screwdriver and stick it down into your soil really easily, you're probably about where you should be. You know, not dripping wet, but moist. That's what you want. Okay, so do you use a, a water timer at all or, or are you just pretty reliable for self-watering? No, so what I usually do is when I'm watering the raised beds with using the soaker hoses, I turn, like I've got it divided up into two zones, one side of my garden and then the other, because if you put too long of a run of soaker hose on there, the end of it tends to not get any water. So I've got it divided into two sections. So I'll turn one section on and I go in the house and I turn on my oven timer for an hour. I turn it on at a really low rate, let it go for an hour. And when the timer goes off, I go put it on the other side for an hour. Oh, that's a pretty, that's a pretty trick to use the oven <laughs> timer. Yeah, nice. I've, I've found that if I don't have some reminder, then it tends to get watered for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have that problem too, and I have a very <laughs> elaborate watering system with a very elaborate timer, so, because I'm not reliable. <laughs> yeah, my love, oven timer is loud enough that I can hear it all over through the house, and it doesn't go off till you walk over there and poke it. <laughs> yep, that's what you need. <laughs> so do you use ladybugs as a pest control do you use any sort of insects i haven't bought any to put in my garden i've done some research on that and what they seem to suggest is that any bug you buy don't hang around your yard very long however my yard does seem to attract all those naturally so you know maybe buying more is kind of a moot point anyway so the take-home message from that would be to plant 
a lot of beneficial flowers to bring in the good bugs. And, and the I do bugs. do that. I didn't, I didn't mention that, but I do do that. Plus, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with making your vegetable garden smell good and look pretty at the same time as growing vegetables. Yep. So give the, give the good bugs and the pollinators reason to come and stay mm -hmm. and add some beauty and some cut flowers for the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Yep. So do you do anything for hail protection considering where you live? I don't. I wish I had the time and resources to do that, but no, I don't. Okay. I've been thinking about building a superstructure over my whole raised bed and covering it with chicken wire, but so far I just haven't had the time or the extra money to do that. I've, I've seen some pretty elaborate and some pretty simple hail protection and it almost always involves hardware cloth. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with hardware <clears throat> cloth, it's a wire mesh that's about a fourth to a half inch, depending upon what you buy, Squares. wide openings. Mm -hmm. And so it's metal. And so when that hail hits the metal, it shreds the hail, hopefully. Not Unless the hail's like baseball size. Yeah, all bets are off. Yeah. I'll bets are off with that. I have some uh, gardening friend who lives east of town where they tend to get more and bigger hail. And he had one of the chicken wire superstructures over his. He had like three raised beds, you know, little ones for tomatoes and peppers and things. He showed me a picture after they got some baseball size hail. It was just a tangled, it looked like, the, you know, the cars that they bring in for the don't drive when drunk. <laughs> yes. yes, it was became an abstract art project over yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's you need to use something that's pretty stout for that hail protection and, mm -hmm. and plastic isn't gonna hold up and cloth isn't gonna hold up. So you nope. gotta go with something that's holes pretty in it. Beauty. Yeah. I would use either chicken wire or hardware cloth or something of that ilk. Yep. A lot of different ways to try to protect that crop. Mm -hmm. That's why I grow tomatoes in the greenhouse. If I, everything else gets hailed out, I still have those. Yep. Well, and the good news is if it does get hailed on, most of those plants will come back and still produce fruit mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. So it's not it's not over unless it's unless it's like you know September or something when it happens. But mm -hmm. you should get you should still get some produce off your vegetables. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, not, anybody else have some questions? And if you have questions, by all means, go ahead and unmute yourself at this point and we can get a discussion going if you'd like. Um, Catherine? Yes. I think you, this is Phil Black. I think you came by my house and took a sample of that veggie cover that I used to cover my raised beds. Doesn't look very glamorous, but um, I've never had it not work with hail. Right. Your, your covering is pretty elaborate and... Well, it's, it's just, it's just conduit poops and, and a big sheet of stuff thrown over. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought of it as being elaborate. <laughs> 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 it, does, it doesn't look very glamorous, but it works. <laughs> Well, and the other trick is is being able to watch the weather, and that's part of being a gardener, whether you're doing flowers or vegetables or mm -hmm. whatever, is you've got to be a weather watcher. Yep. So you've got to, got to kind of pay attention to what's going on, and it helps. I have on my, on my smartphone, I have weather alert app, and so it lets me know if something's coming through. But it really helps to be able to, to know and, and watch the weather so you can run out and throw something over your vegetables and run back in, hope for the best. Yeah, my problem is I work. So if it's coming in the middle of the day when I'm at work, then I'm like, oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Um, all you can do is damage control when you get home. Yep. Um, so when you build raised beds, 
do you, is there a particular material you like? I've seen all sorts of different styles of raised beds done from wood to stock tanks to cinder blocks. All yeah, it all, de all depends on what you're looking for. Like the lady who built hers out of hay bales because she was just going to be there one summer but really wanted to garden, that worked fine for her, you know, it was perfect. So it just depends, you know, are you wanting these to be really permanent? And if you are, I'd look at, you know, something more permanent like cinder blocks or stones or bricks. But if you're, you know, kind of on a budget, then any old timber probably will do. Might have to rebuild them after a couple of years, but they didn't cost that much. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a couple raised beds made out of some old farm wood. Mm -hmm. um, one of them finally after about 10 years is rotted and I'm gonna to have to rebuild it. But it lasted for 10 years before it fell apart. So that's kind of yeah, nice. Yeah. How much, yeah. You know, you can make really fancy ones out of um, that fancy paving stone that they make paths out of, you know, sandstone or granite or whatever. It's gonna cost you an arm and a leg, but that dude ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah, and, and you can always incorporate raised beds as part of the overall landscape and sure. blend it all in together. Yep. Yeah, uh, kind of stair step raised beds or terracing can be a good way to handle a really sloped area. Okay. And then I've got a question here for you. Is perlite better than vermiculite? Well, I used to use either kind of indiscriminately, whichever one I could find, but then I found out that there is some vermiculite that had, has asbestos in it. So I quit using vermiculite altogether and just went straight to perlite. I don't notice a difference in my plants one way or the other. Well, I've, I've noticed that vermiculite will compact in the yeah, soil. Yeah, it does do that over time. Yep. Yeah. So I, I do like perlite and I even use perlite when I plant bulbs so that they have a better drainage system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I like mixing my own um, soil up, like when I'm potting up plants, because if it's a plant that I know has issues with wet feet, then I can add a bit more perlite. That's just me. So when you're putting the soil into your raised bed, Kathy, do you do you mix up your own soil or are you using bags? I mix up my own. I now have compost bins, so I'll get that out if it's ready and mix it with regular garden soil. Maybe throw a bit of perlite in because I have really heavy clayey soil and that helps loosen it up. Well, I know that, you know, when you teach the, um, the plant propagation, you've got a very nice seed starting mix that you use. Yeah, that's not what I put in the raised beds, though. <laughs> that would be too expensive. It would require yes. way too much mixing. <laughs> yes. Well, if there aren't any more questions, you can email me at cwissner at uw yo.edu for a copy of tonight's program. And this has been recorded and I will hand this off to my secretary who will then post it on the Laramie County Extension website and it'll be in the Ag and Hort page. So you can go back and watch this and as a rerun, I guess, or mm -hmm. pass it on to your friends. But oh, if, please do give it to whoever wants it. Yep. That's what it's all about, helping everybody be successful at, at gardening, whether it's vegetables or flowers or your lawn or your trees. It, it's all to help you be successful. So any other questions? If not, I will call an end to tonight's program and I will let everybody know when the next one is coming up and Perhaps next week we'll see who I can get strong arm, who I, who I can strong arm into giving a program. <laughs> I have to say it was pretty painless, so. Yeah, absolutely. And then for everyone out there, don't forget the Laramie County Master Gardener plant sale is still happening. 
but just a different version of it. It's going to be, you order your plants online and then you will pick them up on Sunday, May 31st out at Archer. And if you check out the Laramie County Master Gardener website, and that's lcmg.org, you can go there for a little bit better instructions and the plant list and what to order. There'll be roses. There's gonna be all sorts of really awesome perennials that grow well here in Cheyenne. And there should be quite a few vegetables available. So there's gonna be quite a, a nice selection of plants for everybody. So and that's we, my shameless advertising. And we direct and, our plant growing towards stuff that we know grows well here. Yep, so. absolutely. So with that, I will bid everybody a good night. And Kathy, again, thank you very much for doing this program on raised beds and container gardening. You're welcome. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. All right. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Mm -hmm. Good night, Kathy. Good night.